Hello, good evening, and a big welcome here to tonight's 5 by 15, and have we got a good show ahead of us for you all tonight. Uh, it's Valentine's Day plus one. We've got a small nod to that, but we have also got lots and lots of wonderful things to entertain you with. Couldn't be more pleased to be welcoming our speakers and so many of you at home. Thank you very, very much for joining us. You all know the format. It's a very level format. Everyone gets their allotted space of time and it's the same for everyone. The only other thing I need to mention is that the details of all the speakers' books will be in the chat and our bookseller, Newham Books, will be really happy to help out. So first up tonight is an old friend of 5 by 15. Indeed, I would now say he's a real old friend of the nation. Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter has sort of become to statistics what Sir David Attenborough has become to plants and animals. He is our trusted interpreter of all the numbers that the government have been flinging left, right and centre at us for the last few years. He's the go-to guy when you want to understand what on earth is going on. David is the Professor of the Public Understanding of Risk at Cambridge University, and he's a well-published and well-loved author and science communicator. His latest book is called COVID by Numbers, Making Sense of the Pandemic with Data. He co-wrote it with Anthony Masters. David, welcome back to 5 by 15. You've done some through this pandemic. Uh, is it right to say this is now in the past tense? Oh, no, don't ask me. No, I'm a statistician. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. Not my job. So over to you. Yeah, no, that's um, but that was actually an example, that question from Rosie, very reasonable question to ask, but also very reasonable for me to refuse to answer it in that um, one thing I'm going to just introduce in this talk, I think, is the need for professionals when commenting on something like COVID to keep within their area of expertise. And a mine, I suppose, are numbers, but not just numbers, actual statistics, things that have happened, things that are being measured. And um, we'll come on to other sorts of numbers a bit later. So um, why I'm talking to you, of course, is I'm plugging a book and I wish I was there, you know, with an audience in front and a drink in my hand, etc. Um, but I, I and where this arose from is that Anthony Masters and I were working with the Royal Statistical Society doing some FAQs about COVID. And then I started one column for The Observer, 350 words. And then we we both wrote a column every week for a year, 50 columns. 350 words on COVID statistics. And uh, this was a real challenge, but actually I think we hardly, I don't think we repeated ourselves, extraordinary amount of material. There's so many numbers of so many kinds. And so we wrote a book, uh, Penguin very nicely uh, published that for us. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff in that book. And then I'll, I should have a bit of time just to, um, well, I'll have to make up some questions because we haven't got any questions. So I'm going to share my screen, first of all. I hope this works. I hope you can see that. So that's the book, COVID by Numbers, Making Sense of the Pandemic with Data. Now, the philosophy behind it is that um, we are just trying to explain things. We're trying to inform and not persuade. Because, as I have already hinted at, I do feel that many of the commentators, scientific commentators on, the, on COVID, have actually got a, quite a strong opinion about what should be done. And um, whichever sort of wing of the COVID um, belief system people um, hold, uh, they want to push it. And we've been trying not to do that. So I'd just like to illustrate some data, which I hope just helps people understand what's going on. So, OK, let's have some, no let's have some numbers. There, this is something which is extraordinary as well. You know, why did England, why did Britain suffer so badly? Well, you know, back in late February and early March, the genomic analysis has showed there were more than a thousand separate outbreaks. You know, other countries had real pockets of France and Italy, real concentrated pockets where the virus was. Um, in the UK, it just erupted everywhere, not from China, but from people having been to, on holiday to France, Italy and Spain, and then bringing it back. Except perhaps some of this wasn't just people coming back from holiday, because remember the Madrid-Liverpool match was on March the 11th, and if you look at the distribution of cases brought in from Spain, uh, there is a kind of a uh, bit of a spike around March the 11th. So um, we, we were in a very difficult situation right from the very beginning, and, and also because we didn't know any of this. We had no idea what was going on, operating in a complete blind way until April 2020, 
where I have to say, um, I'm very proud of this, that the Office of National Statistics started their proper survey, which is now has become the en envy of the world. But of course, I'm hopelessly biased because I am chair of the advisory board for the COVID infection survey. So I would say that, wouldn't I? Okay, other, just, I'm, I'm picking, you know, lots of stats in the book. I'm just picking bits and pieces. There's, this is, um, collateral effects of the pandemic response is that there's been no flu. This is just from winter 2020 to 2021, been no flu in the winter we just had, or the winter we're still in, there's no flu either. Um, it's quite extraordinary and unbelievable, um, you know, lack of, of flu. And it's because it's not so extraordinary. It happened in every other country as well, that the measures we take that are to prevent COVID spreading are easily enough to stop flu spreading because it's so much less infectious. Now, there is this issue that what many people have mentioned is that that means two years by any flu in this country, the lack of, that would mean a real reduction in a flu immunity, who knows what's going to happen next winter? It may be very different um, from what we, what, what uh, COVID may not be the problem next winter. Okay, um, excess deaths. This plot, uh, we've con reconstructed this, but essentially it comes from the Office for National Statistics every Tuesday morning. Um, and it, yeah, I could give a whole talk just on the patterns in this data because um, we can see in the first wave, um, big excess deaths, uh, you know, over the black line is what we'd normally expect. Um, but there's excess non-COVID deaths, the blue ones. Uh, these were COVID deaths. Uh, these were in care homes, uh, people who didn't end up having COVID on the death certificate, but in fact were dying from COVID. Completely different picture in the second wave, you see there's a big deficit of non-COVID deaths, far fewer than we would expect. Um, you know, the blue line is below the black line, which is what I'm saying. There. And um, why is this? Well, no flu. And um, that, you know, has saved, uh, you know, possibly 10, you know, 10,000 lives or so over that over last winter. Um, and um, also this issue of what's called mortality displacement, or also the unfortunate name, where well, official name is in Wikipedia, called harvesting, where people's deaths are brought forward, usually because of cold or warm weather, but in this case, because of the first wave of the pandemic, that will have brought deaths forward. And notice after each of these spikes, there's a big, there's a deficit of deaths following from the people whose deaths have been brought forward a few months. However, that is not the norm. The average length of time life lost from a COVID death is about 10 years. So it is not that most people would have died soon anyway. That is a complete myth. Now, um, deaths are, are, are substantially below uh, what we'd expect. And that um, if, we looked at, if we look at deaths from all respiratory diseases now, from COVID and all the others put together, there are fewer deaths with an underlying cause of one of these resp respiratory diseases now than there were in 2015, 2017, 2018. So people who are vulnerable to respiratory diseases are safer now than they were in, before the pandemic in those bad flu years. So that's um, a, an interesting issue and it sort of goes against the continuing um, fear that many people are feeling. And of course, many people are vulnerable. The vulnerability varies enormously from person to person. Many people are vulnerable, but to be honest, they were vulnerable before, sadly. Okay, so let's look at some other, the, the other excess deaths issue which is very important is where people have died this is a, i think a story that hasn't received enough attention even though uh, some of us have been plugging this since the very start of the pandemic if you look in the top left hand corner of those graphs that looks at, looks at excess deaths at home you notice it's been going along at about a thousand a week right through the pandemic regardless of waves regardless of whether there's any virus around these are not covid deaths these are just people who normally would not die at home who are dying at home now, it really looks like these are not additional deaths. Um, these are people who would otherwise have died elsewhere. And so the, 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 what we're seeing is a shift to people dying at home, substantial, about a third extra dying at home now compared to what it was before. Now, people are reluctant to go to hospital quite reasonably. Um, but the crucial question there, like all statistics only generates more questions, what's the quality of these deaths? And uh, I hope this is something that will be will receive considerably more attention in the future. Okay, people claim, oh, well, you know, you, you know, uh, COVID is, is, you know, is not not that big compared with 
other disasters or you know other years that we've had in terms of overall mortality well no actually um the graph on the left just shows all deaths just counting the number of bodies recorded in england and wales and 2020 was the highest since 1918. now there's been lots of other changes over that time um, remember in the second world wars uh, uh fatalities abroad are not counted in 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 wartime so um the the, uh, the 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 that you know is high in absolute numbers, but of course the populations change. We've got older and so on. If we look at on the right hand side, if you look at the crude mortality rate, so that's per hundred thousand people to allow for the change in population, you can see that's been steadily dropping since 1900, but then put on a big spike in 2020. But actually, it was only you know equivalent to the mortality rate perhaps you know at the end of the late 1990s. If we then allow for the change in the population, the older the population getting older, we realize age standardized mortality rates. You know, look what's happened since the Second World War. It's staggering. They've halved essentially. You know, that is absolutely extraordinary what's happened. And then the spike comes up in 2020. In fact, it, it's only in a way put us back to 2000, what, what we were living through in 2003. But that, you know, that doesn't mean it doesn't matter because these are still lives lost that um that you know shouldn't have been given the current state of, of the health of, of of the nation so um i'm going to finish there um i've got a couple of minutes left i think yeah a couple of minutes left now now i would be um asking for questions from the audience but i'm not going to get any so i'm going to have to make them up so thank you very much mr person at the back for saying well what's it been like being a statistician over, over the pandemic and being asked going on the today program and being asked by people like justin webb to to explain all the numbers or or worse being asked by people like nick robinson to to say well what's going to happen or like rosie was asking <laughs> And as I said at the beginning, the, one of the big issues that I had to learn in doing a lot of media work was to try to keep your gob shut when it's not your area of expertise. I used to think you had to answer questions when on the Today programme. No, no, just refuse. No, I'm not going to answer that. That's not my job. I don't do it. So media, I love the media. I think they've done very well on the whole over this pandemic. Um, I think they have done very well. And I've been very happy to work with media data journalism has been fantastic i think on the whole um but they do have a tendency to focus on blame and speculation you know what went wrong whose fault was it and what's going to happen and so well nope not going to answer not going to do it it's somebody else's job and it also you know i'm not even a modeler you know i don't do all those models you know predicting how many cases there'll be in the future i i think they've got a, a really difficult job not actually i think far too much has been expected of them you know we only expect to predict the weather or you know a week, week a week ahead you know to expect these models to work i think is and then to be accurate i think is expecting rather a lot rather too much um so uh i i've you know managed to steer that course and i must say the media have been very good rosie can i go a couple of minutes or would you want me to shut up um, no, I never want you to shut up. Um, you can absolutely have a couple more minutes. Okay. And then I'll have, I'll have my question. response to that, uh, to the, that challenge. Okay, Keep the going. 15 minutes of fame. Um, okay, so uh, next question. Oh, thank you very much, madam, um, for asking me about uh, dealing with misinformation. Because, you know, we, there's so many number the numbers being thrown around, and some of these come from official sources, and then there are claims being made on social media and on YouTube in particular, which is an appalling source of misinformation. It doesn't mean at least Facebook makes some sort of effort to scrutinize what's on there. But YouTube really um, seems to be a, a dreadful source. Um, and, um, and, and people making claims on the basis of statistics. There are websites full of statistics, full of claims of people about you know the harms from vaccines the 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 fact that covid isn't so important um you know most there, there was always this thing you know, about a case demic that went on for some time until it was so obviously untrue um and so on so all this these stories all the time coming out oh i oh, know no, don't ask me about don't talk about ivermectin and all these claimed cures that are out in there all based on pretty well shabby statistics um so the, the People, and there's a huge attraction for these among people I know, um, you know, educated friends of mine. 
say, oh, you know, have you seen this video? Have you seen this paper? And it's some awful paper that somebody's done show, you know, claiming to show the exact effect of face masks and lockdowns, which you just can't, you can't, you don't know. You can't say what was the effect of these lockdowns. Um, you know, it's just not possible to answer that question from the available data. And yet people claim to great accuracy to be able to say what those answers are. And um, it's very difficult to deal with that, I have to say. Um, and uh, I, what it's led me is to realize is that the crucial issue is trust and identifying trustworthy sources. And I'd love to come back sometime to 5 by 15 to give an entire 15 minutes on who can we trust. With that, I will shut up. Thank Dr. You David, well, that is absolutely a deal. We will have you on that. I mean, who do we trust? Probably is the greatest question we've got facing us at the moment. And so um, I, I think you laid down a lot of challenges for our next speaker about saying that when you're on the Today programme, all you need to do is shut up and say nothing. I love that. I was laughing away on my own and wishing that I was in a big audience who would all have been laughing. And I trust that our next speaker, who is Justin Webb, would also have been laughing. Um, Justin, as everyone knows, wakes us up in the morning. So at the moment, we're kind of breaking his normal time continuum by having him live with us uh, on air at uh, in the evening. Um, Justin's been a journalist all his life. He's got so many extraordinary achievements. He was head of the Washington Bureau. He was the first British journalist to be granted a sit down TV interview with Barack Obama, um, onwards and upwards. Uh, he's here tonight, though, to talk about his new book, his memoir, The Gift of a Radio, My Childhood and Other Train Wrecks, which I think is the most amazing title and already makes you really, really want to know what this book is about. It's had fantastic reviews, so I know a bit. But Justin, um, I hope you weren't too offended by it, David. Do a lot of your um, people you have on the Today programme refuse to say anything like him? But anyway, over to Two you. Two things I about I want to Actually, I'm going to start with David because it's so important. The, the reason why we love him is, number one, he doesn't talk off the subject and say things about things he doesn't know anything about. Number two, when you ask him a question, he answers it and he's got things to say and they're quite bombastic things, as I think we've just been hearing. And that is, if any of you are coming on this today program, that is the way to do it. Uh, turning to my book, uh, it's the opposite of an, a book about achievements, really. It was very, very nice of you, Rosie, to talk about my um, uh, moderate achievements in the world of journalism. This isn't a, a book about achievements. It's not a book about I did this and I did that. It starts on a beach in Dorset and my stepfather swimming out to sea and um, ducking under the waves. He's quite a good swimmer. And me as a very young child sitting with my mother on the beach, uh, hoping that he would die, hoping that he would not come back. Uh, and the book gets more and more cheerful from that moment on. Uh, and I'm only slightly joking. I hope it has humour in it, but it is the book of a very, very strange, eccentric and unhappy and lonely childhood. And it's a book about how no one was to blame for that, how there is atonement and forgiveness of all the things that we do wrong to each other because we are complex human beings and possibly we judge each other. In fact, certainly we judge each other too much now uh, in our social media age based on what we've slightly heard about each other or what we were thinking last Tuesday that we might not be thinking next Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also a book about the 1970s and that's quite an important part of it. So my mother goes to the doctor after she has married my stepfather, Charles, about a week afterwards. And she married him in order to protect me. This is 1960, uh, 1961. Um, and there is still um, quite a lot of stigma attached to being a single woman with a child and quite a lot of practical difficulty as well. So she hooks up with Charles. She meets him by the um, pages of the New Statesman, very early adopter of um, the kind of dating rules that are now pretty commonplace. She um, marries him. A week later, she finds him in the morning pouring the milk down the sink. Uh, and he says it's been poisoned. And she has an appointment anyway with the doctor. So she thinks it's something she maybe ought to mention to him. So she does. And the doctor, who was also Charles's doctor, turns to her and says, 
And Mrs. Webb, I'm sorry to inform you, your husband is stark staring mad. And that was the diagnosis. The treatment was Valium. It didn't really do much good. And my mother was stuck not only now with me, but also with uh, this stark staring mad uh, stepfather. And a problem over my real father, which I'll get to in a few moments time. My mother was an extraordinary woman. She was staggeringly affectionate and loving me. I can still feel her love now, many, many years after she died. I know she would want even this to be a success because everything that I was involved with, she was involved with. And it is an extraordinary power that. She was also a brilliant speaker of Spanish, a member of Amnesty International, a CND person. She went to Greenham Common, a deeply serious person, a Quaker. At the same time, she was a snob of the most staggering proportions. Uh, even now, I cannot say in a BBC script the word toilet. And let's be blunt, when uh, Jeremy Hunt was culture secretary, we quite often said ruder things than toilet on the air. I cannot bring myself to say it. Mother would not approve. She thought it was disgusting and it could not possibly be said on air or indeed anywhere else. But it didn't stop with uh, toilet. Uh, in fact, it got bizarre. It included begonias, which she regarded as a lower middle class plant. Uh, it included um, the word controversy when the second syllable was pronounced. Uh, so it was pronounced controversy. Uh, she couldn't stand that either. And there was a whole list of words that were mispronounced, she thought. Um, it, it went particularly to French words that had been anglicized. So perfume, I can remember from a very early age, was scent. Uh, and frankly, for me, still is. Uh, serviette had to be napkin. We had a lot of difficulty with furniture in a room because sofas and settees and the rest of it were all banned. And we called our large chair a divan uh, with a slight stress on the last syllable. Why, goodness only knows. What does this do to you? Well, it was the 70s. And here, I think, is where the 70s become quite important uh, because the 70s were a period in the nation's history where we were changing from one thing to another. We were changing from our sort of collectivist society, our post-war collectivism, uh, into something very different, something uh, more individualistic. But it was also, of course, a long time ago. And what fascinates me is how some of the attitudes from the 70s still persist in people of my age. I'm 60 or so, and actually still persist throughout society. When I told my um, daughter Clara one day, as I was driving her home from school, when she was a young child, I was talking about the depredations of my youth. And I said, um, you know, Daddy, Daddy didn't even have a car when we were when, when he grew up. And she said, oh, when were they invented? In other words, to the young generation, the 70s just feel like this other age. And in a sense, I think they're right, because it was the age when you could still be a member of a large organization, subsumed in that organization, uh, cosseted by that organization, whether it was a trade union, a political party, a church, this was uh, a period, the 70s, of hugeness. Um, this period where I grew up, I, was, um, I, I came of age, as it were, in 1979, took my A-levels in 1979, so Mrs. Thatcher finally comes to power, the nation does begin to change uh, a lot. But the period of the 70s that I remember, for all the obvious things that were awful about it, and the coal dust and the misery, actually, of three-day weeks and IRA bombs and all the rest of it, there is this weird thing that social class and snobbery kind of did for us all. It protected us. It protected my mum, who was on the way down socially. And I think that's an interesting thing. There were This was the era of distressed gentlefolk, and my mother was certainly one of them, and my granny uh, hugely one of them. My granny, who used to drink sweet wine out of a medicine bottle in a wimpy bar, uh, at lunchtime in Bath, where she lived. Uh, sweet wine, my mother had told me, was working class when it was drunk with a meal. So I once said to her, why does granny 
I do something that is so obviously working class. And she laughed and said, well, granny's granny. And of course, this wonderful thing when you're very, very sure of yourself is that absolutely nothing ever gets in your way. Uh, my mother thought the Queen was common uh, because the Queen had opened up Buckingham Palace to um, uh, the TV cameras, the BBC, I guess, in the late 1960s, which she thought was a, was a vulgar thing to do. Those class things protect you. They protected mum. And also, of course, it's fair to say they protected hugely psychologically. People who were genuinely downtrodden, who my mum regarded uh, as the lower orders, and she would use those, those words without irony, they also protected them because you could genuinely say to yourself, well, I'm never going to be a judge in that famous Peter Cook sketch. I can't be a judge because I don't have the Latin. Uh, well, you didn't. And if you hadn't been to Eton, you probably couldn't be a judge. But you could be a minor and you could feel that the things that were keeping you down were not, were not your own fault. And I think actually, weirdly, that was a psychological relief valve um, that we've lost in, in the period since. I should mention my biological father. He was Peter Woods, very famous newsreader in the uh, 1970s. I found out about him when my mother turned to the television one evening. I must have been watching Blue Peter or something, and the news came on, and it was him. And she said, that man's your father. And she never mentioned it again. And she never wanted to. And I knew she never wanted to. At an early stage, knew viscerally that she never wanted to. Uh, and I never really mentioned it to her again either. There was one rather sticky moment when he came on the Morecambe and Wise show, all the newsreaders came on, and he uh, ended the show by singing There Ain't Nothing Like a Dame. He had a very deep voice, and my mother kind of coughed, and I think my stepfather and said, well, we'd better put the television away. And my mother said the words, which I'll always remember, he had shoes like the Queen Mary, um, and that was it. Uh, it was an odd, repressed, strange childhood. It was a childhood that also um, resulted then because my mother was desperate for me to get away from this peculiar home life with this person who was behaving very, very uh, oddly on a good day and absolutely in a deranged manner on a bad day. She wanted me to get away. She sent me to a Quaker boarding school. And um, you know the old Woody Allen joke about being so weedy or beaten up by Quakers. Well, I, I was actually uh, <laughs> beaten up by Quakers, because all schools, all kind of minor league private schools in the 1970s, I think were pretty dreadful. But it is extraordinary that Quakers um, oversaw a school that was um, pretty horrific in its own right. Not horrific in terms of the uh, teachers being beastly to the children, though occasionally they were, but more actually in the kind of Lord of the Flies way that we were beastly to each other. Um, which I talk a bit about um, in the school. And just that 1970s thing that nobody really cared. Um, a, a hilarious example, hilarious in retrospect, because I don't think anyone ever in the end got stuck, but there was a thing called the Sidcote School Speleological Society, the caving group, which was mainly boys, actually. The girls didn't cave in those days, uh, who would go out at the weekends to the caves in the Mendips, and there are lots of caves in the Mendips around um, Wiki Hole and places like that, Cheddar, and go down caves. Nobody knew where they are or even thought to ask. And uh, uh, when a new headmaster came right at the end of my time at the school, that was one of the first questions he asked, and he was roundly despised by everyone for asking it. In the 70s, you just didn't care. It properly was um, another country. There is also, um, uh, if I've got, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute more, um, I think I probably have. What is my time? Yeah. Let, let me take one minute just to say it's also about an era ending and all the things that my mother believed coming unstuck. Just a, a, a couple of years ago, I was walking past the Ritz Hotel in London and I was on my way to do a corporate event. And I realized that the top button of my shirt had come out. It, 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 it had fallen off. And um, my mother used to tell me stories of going into the Ritz with men friends when she was in her young, um, uh, wild phase and asking in the middle of the night for a boiled egg. Because in the Ritz, my dear, um, if you speak properly, they'll give you anything you want. Uh, so 
I, I suddenly, for some reason, I channeled her. I thought the easiest thing to do is just go into the Ritz and see if she is right. And I went in and I said to them, look, I'm terribly sorry. I've lost the button at the top of my shirt. Is it possible for someone to mend it? And I was taken into a side room. Yes, of course, sir. And they did it all. And I said, thank you very much. Um, and it was very kind of you. I was just some random person off the street. There could not have been more helpful. But as I was going, I said to the concierge, I'm a little bit late now. Could I get a taxi as well? And he said, yes, of course, Mr. Vine, I'll order you one. And the awful thing was that my mother would have hoped that I got the button sewn because of my breeding. The reality in 2015, 16, whenever this was, was that it was celebrity. They had mistaken me for Jeremy Vine, who was then absolutely a celebrity, had just been on uh, Strictly Come Dancing, et cetera. That era, um, that my mother celebrated and then in many ways protected her um, was over. And it, it, in, in some respects, I think it kind of provided for me a full stop, um, albeit very long after the event, to my uh, peculiar and eccentric childhood. With that, Rosie, I'll hand back to you. Justin, that was fantastic. Thank you. And I've just noticed that Adam has put Adam Rutherford has put in the chat, I'm absolutely getting this audio book. And I have to say that <laughs> I am too. Um, my mother also was an absolutely crashing snob about all sorts of things. And you will always refer to my sisters and mine's first boyfriends as common. And I've still really <laughs> never quite figured out what the definition, what my mother's definition. I'd forgotten that word. Common. Oh, all poison. the time. Dripping with poison. It just was about someone who was just actually interesting, I think, rather than, um, you know, with two feet in the public school. Anyway, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I can't wait to read it. What was a wonderful story. And I love the, I love the tale about the Ritz, actually. I think, I mean, hopefully we could all, all challenge that and see what would happen. Anyway, that was great. Um, Thank you. Our, our next uh, speaker is indeed now somewhere connected to Valentine's Day about love, how we find it, how we sustain it, how do we survive when we lose it. And to help us answer these questions, it's great to welcome the author of Conversations on Love, Natasha Lund. And Natasha's uh, made a compendium uh, of different stories, Philippa Perry on falling in love slowly, Alain de Botta on the psychology of being alone, Dolly Alderton on vulnerability, plus a lot, a lot more people are in your sights, Natasha. Um, welcome to 5 by 15. Uh, we love your artificial flowers. I know that because you told us. But You're giving me away. You're giving me No, away. I'm not giving away. I was <laughs> going to suggest that you could stick the stick how we get where we get them from because they're so beautiful. Um, anyway, to me if you look thank, you. Close, so. thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosie. Um, so... I used to think that I was somebody that was obsessed with love. Um, and it's true to say, I spent a long time thinking about it. And I spent a lot of Sundays looking at couples in my teens and twenties, holding hands in the park, thinking, will I ever find love? Am I gonna be on my own forever? And it really became the question that I was consumed by and that sort of drained a lot of other happiness from my life because I assumed that if I could just find this romantic relationship then everything else in my life would fall into place um, and I would be happy but at that at that point I wasn't really I mean I would look at my life at the beginning of every year and I would think okay career I can pour loads of effort into that I can maybe have a career change or try and get a promotion here's what I can do or with my health here are the areas I need to focus on and it's pretty clear what I need to do to improve them but when I look at love I think well there's just nothing that I can do about it it's just something that will either happen to me or not um, and I would just sit here and wait for it and be miserable when it never finds me um, but during that period I never really stopped to ask what love is like what does it mean what's my definition of it um, and embarrassingly, I was much more obsessed with finding someone to love me. I didn't really think about what it might be like to give love or how I could improve it or how I could contribute to it. Um, and I don't think that many of us do. We're not really encouraged to learn to prioritize love in the same way that we would our career or, or our health or our body. And we're certainly not encouraged to learn about it in the way we would grammar or geography or politics. Um, so that's why years later, after my uh, many, many failures and mistakes, 
I decided to do exactly that, to begin prioritizing love and pouring as much attention into learning about it as I would anything else important in my life. Because it's kind of crazy if you think about it, that this thing we know is so important, we expect it to just tick along and for us not to really carve out any time to learning about it or practicing it or getting better at it. So that's why for the last four years, I've been interviewing authors and experts and writers about all the different shapes of love in their lives. Um, I guess like the aim has been to investigate love one conversation at a time. Um, and it really is no exaggeration to say that the aunt, the lessons and the conversations I've had have changed my life. And there's something that I now lean on every day and just have transformed the way I am with everybody who I love in my life. So uh, tonight I'm gonna try and very speedily tell you five of the more surprising things that I've learned about love in the hope that maybe they can help you too. Um, so number one is really about looking for love and um, it's to not always trust your gut. And I was somebody who just completely trusted their gut in love the whole time. I remember um, meeting a comedy sketch writer with a friend when I was in my early twenties and saying, I'm gonna marry this man within minutes. And, and I remember being in a relationship that was not very happy and friends saying to me, you know, I, it just doesn't feel right. You don't seem happy. And I said, you don't understand. I just feel it in my bones, this connection. Um, and I understood this more years later when I interviewed a psychotherapist called Frank Tallis. And he said to me, sometimes when we, sometimes we use those words like chemistry or gut feeling or this sort of mystical connection to somebody, when we don't really have any evidence of a real connection, like I had no examples of kindness or consistent periods of time spent with somebody or just acts of care. And so what can happen is because you don't have anything tangible to hang the feeling on, you almost think that it's, it's more profound. You're like, I can't describe it, so it must be fate. There are no words for it, so it must be profound. So in this way, almost it's like your lack of evidence can fuel the romantic mysticism. And, and of course, that's just one false inference feeding another. So I found that really helpful just to be slightly suspicious of chemistry and gut feelings that come automatically in love. Um, not just because they might not be a sign of real intimacy, but also because they could be a sign of a complete lack of it. So that's number one. Um, number two is that feelings are not enough. And I did used to imagine that love was the feeling that I would get when I looked at somebody and cared about them deeply and the feeling that they would feel when they did the same to me. But something that's come up again and again, actually, in my conversations is just that feelings are not enough to sustain a relationship. And firstly, because we won't always feel in love with our partners. And sometimes you might look at somebody and feel that like deep love for them. And, and the next hour or day, you look at them and feel deeply frustrated and irritated by them. And what I've learned is love is not the feeling that disappears in those moments. It's actually the decision to be kind or to choose to act lovingly towards someone even in those moments. And it's, you know, sometimes that's what love is. It's choosing to act lovingly towards someone even when we don't feel in love with them um, but the second part of that is something that the psychotherapist and couple therapist Esther Perel told me that she said if some one of her clients comes to her and says I love my partner she's like well that's all very well but what do you do to demonstrate like to demonstrate that love the fact that you feel it isn't enough you need to go out of your way to to demonstrate to that person that they're important to you and I think about that all the time. And I just carry that line like a little talisman in my head. If I'm sitting there thinking about missing and loving a friend or loving my partner, it's, it's no good really to just sit there and have those feelings. You have to remind yourself to show that intention to them and to just find ways to demonstrate that somebody's important to you. So remembering that feeling in love is not enough has been very useful to me. Um, number three, is that long-term love is mysterious. And I think, again, another um, unhelpful assumption that I had about love 
was that long-term love involved finding out and knowing absolutely everything about another person and there being nothing that you didn't tell them and yeah you just knew each other so fully um and an author called Mira Jacob helped me to see like of course that's impossible we can never really know another person because when you begin a relationship with someone you're not really choosing a person you're choosing how you weather change sorry that's obviously a supermarket delivery um how you weather change with it alongside them because one of your parents going to get sick one of your sex drive is going to change somebody's going to lose their job and somebody's going to get a promotion all all these things change and that would lead to each of you having different versions of yourself are going to emerge and you have to keep getting to know those different versions and um, Amira said sometimes she's been with her partner for 20 years she'll be sat around and he'll say something and she'll be like who are you even after 20 years he'll be so new to her in that moment and um, and I used to find that you know I used to think there was safety in knowing someone completely and now I really think the opposite that that's what makes long-term love so amazing that there still can be mystery you can find in somebody after 20 years. And actually it's not that you fall in love at the beginning and that's that. We have opportunities to fall in love again and again. Um, and I guess like you can always write new beginnings into your familiar love stories. Um, and then number four is that life is full of many different love stories. Like I said at the beginning, I sort of approached this being thinking, oh, I want to find romantic love and that's what I see love as and, and this is going to be my be all and end all. Um, but I've, I've interviewed people about their love for a poem and a tree and a city. And I've spoken to people who found love in the midst of grief and who have found love in connecting to a stranger in a really vulnerable moment. So these conversations have just, expanded my idea of love into this big boundless thing and I just see that it comes in so many shapes and forms and acts um but also that none of those things are acquired or given and actually we have to learn and earn them and keep choosing them every day so I've been getting asked a lot speaking about love coming out of the pandemic about you know how is this going to change and people are emerging from this much more convinced about how important love is. And, and I'm, I'm feeling that from people, people know that they want to be in each other's physical presence and they value their friendships and, and they want to be with people and build communities. But um, maybe I'm a little cynical in that I think we know these things and we learn these lessons, but we, we forget them so easily. And I think there is a risk that we get back to normal lives and, and those things slip away again. Um, so I hope that what Conversations on Love will be for people is what it's been for me, which is just a constant reminder, small reminders all the time, to not let the people in your life slip into the background and just to recognize and pay attention to all the small opportunities that exist for love inside each day. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was that was really lovely. Um, you would be a brilliant um, you'd be a brilliant therapist as well. That was amazing oh. good to hear. Very good not life sure, lessons. Not sure my husband would agree. <laughs> oh well, I think they were very good life lessons. So thank you very much, Natasha. Now our, our next speaker is going to go off in a fairly less, uh, not exactly such an upbeat direction. Um, Adam Rutherford is incredibly familiar to anyone who listens to Radio 4 with his wonderful um inside science as well as the curious cases of Rutherford and Fry, and indeed presenting an absolutely brilliant start the week yesterday, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Now he's coming to talk to us tonight about his new book called Control, which is the history of eugenics, uh, which is the attempt by any society to create things that they think are perfect and also to create and get rid of things that are very imperfect. And indeed, the study of eugenics and the practice of eugenics has dogged societies for a very long time. Um, I don't think it's something that's entirely gone away, but Adam, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm so looking forward to this talk. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Rosie. And yeah, as you say, I mean, this is this is much less uplifting and um, than Natasha's talk, but it does have resonance with both uh, Justin and and David's David's talks from earlier because it, this is a subject which is fraught and obsessed with class and the ranking of people, and and also um, is is synonymous with the birth of modern statistics as well. I've got slides because. That's what scientists do. So let me let me share my screen with you. So the, the, the concept of eugenics is most closely associated with um, the, the, the atrocities of, of the Nazis. But in fact, it has a much deeper and longer history than that and is something that has been with us from our earliest works and at least the Western canon, Plato describes a form of eugenics back in, in Republic. Um, but um, this gets over the idea uh, that what I'm interested in, because I approach this subject as a scientist and as a geneticist, is the idea of eugenics, the formalization of the idea of population and birth control. And the, the, as you say, Rosie, the weeding out of undesirable characteristics. And the Adam, I can't see your slide. I'm no, sorry. No, that's because it was a blank slide, but thank you. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, and in fact, the formalization of this whole idea starts in the 18. Uh, the late 19th century with Francis Galton, who was also a Quaker, another link with, with Justin's talk there. But I'm not going to talk about him um, so much as the one of the most significant countries that adopted uh, eugenics as policy, which is the United States, and then ultimately its influence on the pathway to the Holocaust. What, what I'm really interested in is not just the presence of, 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 of eugenics in our uh, to today, the legacy of this what has become a toxic idea, but how a small sort of esoteric scientific idea becomes um, policy and ultimately becomes genocide in just a few decades, the sort of idea of a, a ripple in the pond. This is Francis Galton, the guy who comes up with the idea, the cousin of Darwin, uh, enamored with Darwin's work on natural selection, figures that we can apply the same principles of artificial selection, such as farming to humans and thus uh, improve the quality, the quality of people. This is a sort of version of his definition, which which comes a bit later. Um, but I want to switch to America but, and, and talk fundamentally. Oh, sorry. On, on, uh, one idea that is absolutely essential in the, the, the theory of eugenics as it emerged in the 19th century was that there are individual genes for individual characteristics and that these would determine our life. So it's the nature versus nurture question, which was, in fact, formulated by Galton in the 1890s. And the eugenicists believed very much that there were individual characteristics which we were wedded to. And if you had that version of the gene, then that is how your life would turn out. Now, it, it, it in fact turned out in the 20, late 20th century with the Human Genome Project that this model is just not very good. It's not accurate. It's not how we describe genes at all. However, that hasn't made it true to the popular view. And here's just a selection of headlines from the last 10 years from a selection of papers where we reiterate this idea, this specious idea that a single gene will influence you in all sorts of complex ways, a gene that will scare you out of your mind, make you take risky decisions, will make you happy, transsexual, make you politically left. I, the bottom centre one, I don't even know how that would work, a gene that predicts what time of day you will die. Um, but uh, there you go. And this model is, is just incorrect. It's just not how human genetics works, and yet it is absolutely pervasive through our, our culture and our understanding of how biology interacts with behavior, interacts with society. It was so fundamental to the eugenics movement. I'm gonna to switch to America now and introduce Charles Davenport, who's the sort of equivalent of Francis Galton in America. In fact, met Francis Galton in the 1890s and transported and developed his ideas. I'll talk about H.H. Goddard in, in, in just a minute. But Davenport, founded the eugenics research office at what is now Cold Spring Harbor, one of the greatest laboratories in, in the world. And in it, he tried to formulate and promote the idea that eugenics was both good for society and would help shape our or cure our social problems. But it was also something that he was obsessed was about was collecting pedigrees of people so that if you could work out the patterns of inheritance, just like Mendel and his peas a few years earlier, if you could work out the patterns of inheritance in families, then you could determine their characters and therefore you could identify the things that you wanted to enhance 
and the things that you wanted to remove from society. So this is a photo of a Charles Davenport in the front row with a pointy beard. And he what part of what the eugenics research office did was train up people to go out into the field, particularly into rural areas. And just like with cattle and sheep shows at agricultural fairs would encourage people to fill out forms um, uh, and would reward them with, uh, with, with medals and um, competitions, fitter family competitions. And this was the, the basis of them generating data that they would then use in the eugenics research office. This is one of their, their, their departments in order to construct these, these pedigrees. They wanted to construct a pedigree for all Americans. So therefore they could identify the genes as they ran through families and therefore could apply eugenics principles to their work. And indeed they did. From 1907, the United States, uh, with the first legislation was passed in Indiana uh, for the enforced sterilization of people deemed unworthy by society. And over the course of the 20th century, United States, 31 states in the USA, it had um, legislation for eugenics. We estimate between 70 and 80,000 people were sterilized against their will or in many cases against their knowledge. And if you think this has gone away, the most recent cases of enforced sterilization in the states happened in 2021 in the ICE detention centers, admittedly far fewer numbers, probably in the, in the dozens, um, but this is something that is ongoing, not just all around the world in, in countries such as India and China, but in the United States. Now, I wanna tell for the, for the second half of the last few minutes of this, this, this talk, I wanna talk about H.H. Goddard, another key player in the eugenics movement. So Goddard was a psychologist, the first person to translate the IQ tests, which had been formulated in France into English and introduce them to America. The IQ tests under Goddard's watch were used at Ellis Island to select people, immigrants to deem whether they were deemed intellectually worthy or not of ent entering the company, uh, the country. Um, but that's not what the story I wanna tell either. I wanna tell the story of uh, Goddard's work of Deborah Kalakak, a seven-year-old girl that he had been treating that he described as uh, a standard imbecile, a moron, the type of girl that we find in our reformatories. Now, this was the language of, of the day, but it was a, a she, she, she had non-specific psychiatric and mental health conditions that got, fell into the category that was generally known as feeble-mindedness. And Goddard set about to try and understand in exactly the way that Charles Davenport had done in the years before and after the pedigree, the family from which she came in order that we'd understand how this concept of feeble mindedness flowed through families and into Deborah as an eight year old girl. So he constructed an exhaustive family tree that went back right the way uh, um, uh, many generations back to identify the founder of this family a man called Martin Kalakak, who was a returning war hero, revolutionary war hero, who on the way back to his Quaker wife, again, I mean, I think the Quakers are pretty good on the whole, but Quakers seem to feature quite heavily tonight and not in a good way. But on the way back from the war to his Quaker wife, Martin Kalakak stopped off at a bar and had sex with what he described as an attractive but feeble-minded barmaid. And he never saw her again and he returned to his Quakeress wife. But what H.H. Goddard did is track this family and worked out that there was a perfect bifurcation. The family derived from the attractive but female, uh, the attractive but feeble minded barmaid were full of delinquents and people with hereditary conditions. Um, they were diseased. They had, what, again, a term that we don't use anymore, mongolism that ran throughout their family and were besieged by inherited problems, whereas his Quaker family were fine and upstanding and full of bankers and teachers and were wealthy and upstanding members of the clergy. So he'd identified that this gene ran, the delinquency gene for feeble mindedness ran through this branch of one family as set up by Martin um, having sex with the attractive but feeble minded barmaid. But on the other family, his, his uh, Quakeress upstanding wife, um, everything was fine and dandy. Now, this is, he published this in a book in 1912, which is an international bestseller and profoundly influential around the world in terms of thinking about how hereditary diseases were passed through families. This is from a textbook in, 19, in the 1950s, which shows on the right-hand side his, his worthy Quakeress wife and full of upstanding um, uh, members of society, whereas on the left-hand side, the feeble-minded tavern girl bore a son known as Old Horror, 
Anyway, now there's many complexities within this story. And we, the, the whole concept of a single gene, it's my dog downstairs, the single gene um, determining something as vaguely described as feeble mindedness, we now know is absolutely incorrect, not, not a sensible way to understand genetics in the slightest bit. But none of that really mattered because it turned out that the Kalakak family never existed. The feeble-minded tavern girl did not exist. And in fact, the family that he was investigating was an entirely unrelated family, unrelated to Martin Kalakak himself, who, who was a real man, um, and was an amalgam of different families, which were, did have some heritable problems within their family, but also had fine upstanding members of the clergy and, and, um, and the teaching profession as well. And in fact, some of the children in the Kalakak family, the diseased delinquent side, had fetal alcohol syndrome. But we, that, we can now identify that using photos in the original book itself. And of course, fetal alcohol syndrome is not heritable genetically. It is caused by environmental constraints. So it was a fiction. It was, it was not something which was um, uh, correct at all. Uh, it was made up, and yet it was incredibly influential. Now, this is 1912. I'm going to cut immediately to Germany. And this is a tedious academic slide that I use in my lectures at UCL, where I teach. But let's talk about eugenics in Germany for just a second, because it was formulated at the same time in the late 1890s and developed during the first two decades of the 20th century. Interestingly, not anti-Semitic in, in origin. In fact, the idea of Nordic purity was thought to be enhanced by mating with uh, um, Jewish people, Ashkenazi Jewish people, in, in order uh, to, to help Nordic people be more successful. 1920, the concept of lives unworthy of life, Labens and Bet Laban was introduced. And so this, this began the, the snowballing effect that would culminate in the, in, in the po policies of the Nazis in, from 1933 onwards. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the, the development of eugenics policy in the States was profoundly influenced both intellectually and financially by the US geneticists, uh, eugenicists, such as Charles Davenport and the eugenics research office. The Rockefeller Foundation funded several re uh, eugenics research offices in Berlin and around Germany until 1938. When Hitler came to power in 33, one of the first laws that he passed with his then absolute power was the enforced sterilization law. And it was directly translated from a law written by one of the members of the ERO, Harry Lachlan, in 1920. And 1939, Action T4 was in, implemented, which gave the framework for ultimately what would become the, um, uh, the termination of many, many millions uh, during the Holocaust. Now, the Nazis were adept propagandists. And in order to pass the 1939 law, Hitler said that he didn't think that people would accept these euthanasia and eugenics policies outside of wartime. And the 1939 Axiom T4 law was in fact backdated. It was signed in October 1939. It was backdated to the 1st of September, which is when um, the Allies declared war. In 1935, um, this, this fil a film was released, a 12 minute film that ran in front of most cinemas uh, most mainstream films in cinemas around Germany called Das Erbe. Um, das Erbe means the inheritance broadly. And it's a short film in which a young female student is watching two stag beetles rut. And she calls over her professor, which is in the top right slide there. She calls over the professor and says, what's going on here? And he explains to her that this is nature. This is how Darwinian, the struggle for existence happens in nature and shows her, sits her down and shows her a film, which includes various things, some, some um, some stags rutting with each other, a cat catching a bird, and in the bottom left, a dog catching a hare. And they're sitting around watching this film and they're laughing and the, the, the student suddenly gets it. And she, she clicks her finger and says, and says in German, oh, I get it. Even nature has its racist policies. And they all laugh and it's, uh, it, it's terribly amusing to them. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of minutes of the film. I hope this is gonna work um, because it's very striking what happens next. So this is a clip and film. There is sound on it, but I'm going to talk over it. So here they are in the cinema with the professor explaining to the students how dog pedigrees work. The hunting dogs have been bred for many years in order to purify their breed to make them better hunters. Now watch what happens now. Die Nachkommen des Leutnants Kalikak, 
aus seiner Ehe mit einer erbgesunden Frau waren alle gesund. So he's describing the Kalakak family tree that in 1935, so 23 years after it was published. And on the right hand side, that Eb Gesunde Frau means sort of healthy, upstanding women. 493. But there on the left, the Eb Heinke Frau, which sort of means. Uh, hereditary ill women, and those black dots, the mark of the feeble-mindedness pouring through the generations. Okay. And then what happens is it cuts to some some images of people in um, uh, sanatoriums and mental health uh, clinics from around Germany with the bill, the cost to society of maintaining these Lebens und Werte Lebens, lives unworthy of life. And then it finishes with a quote from Hitler himself, um, uh, which says, who is, physically, uh, who is physically and mentally not healthy and worthy may not perpetuate his suffering in the body of a child. Now, right, I'll just please stop that because it's absolutely horrific. Um, and I'll stop sharing as well, because I think I'm, I'm gonna finish there. But basically this is a, just a tiny nugget of what I'm really interested in, which is how ideas become normalized, how tiny scientific ideas are, um, are co-opted, marshaled into political ideologies and how a small esoteric academic idea can in only the course of 40 or 50 years result in a pseudoscientific justification for genocide. That's where I'm going to end. Um, and I asked if I would not go last because that's such a miserable story, but it is an important story. And to understand the relationship between science and ideology is, is really where, where I'm best placed. So thank Gosh, you. Adam, thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting. And I will definitely go and read the book. That was fascinating following that family through to that. I had no idea when you showed us the first slide with the good children on the one side and the deplorables on the other, that it was going to come bouncing back all those years later. It's, uh, it's very chilling. Anyway, thank you for writing it. Thank you for being with us. Now, we're going to go somewhere completely different, somewhere historical and somewhere to a story that I have to say, when I first read the reviews of this book, I thought, I know absolutely nothing. And it's one of these wonderful five by 15 challenges, which is to tell a gigantic story in a very short space of time. Uh, our speaker is Edward Ed Shawcross, and he came across this extraordinary story when he was doing his PhD on French imperialism in Latin America. And his story is about a, a, a reckless military adventure in the mid 19th century to establish a monarchy in Mexico. And Napoleon III, intent on curbing the rise of American imperialism, decided to send a young Austrian Archduke and a Belgian princess all the way across the Atlantic to Mexico and set themselves up as the emperor and the empress of Mexico. And it was his aim to hold off the forces of North America. Well, anything with a start like that is bound to go wrong, as I think we'll see. Uh, Ed, thank you very much for being with us. And quite frankly, the challenge is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Rosie. Well, um, as Adam said after his brilliant but chilling talk, I I'm on last to cheer you up. And um, unfortunately, I'm going to tell you a tale of hubris, madness, and death. Um, so I'm, it might distract you. I don't know if it will cheer you up. Now, the story that I'm going to tell is operatic in scope. And I'll try and condense it into 12 minutes. Um, and it involves some of the most famous people of their time. Yet outside of Mexico, where most of the action happened, I don't think many people um, know about it. Uh, I do think, though, perhaps you might know how it ends, um, because there's a very famous painting, which I will um, get up on, on, on as a slide in front of us now. This is the execution of Maximilian by the French artist Edouard Manet. 
And the man in the centre is indeed Ferdinand Maximilian Habsburg Archduke, who was caught up in these monumental events of the 1860s. And so today I'm going to try and answer a question um, that he himself might well have been wondering uh, in this moment captured on canvas. What on earth is a man born in Vienna, an Austrian Archduke, doing facing a, a firing squad in Mexico? And the story actually has quite a lot of parallels with, with, with recent events and foreign interventions, because that's what brought him there. It's an example of regime change on an epic scale in Mexico. And so why on earth um, Mexico? Well, there were some in Mexico who called for him to rule over uh, uh, them as a monarch. They wanted to replace a republic with a monarchy. And why did they want that? Well, the story of Mexico in the 19th century is not a happy one. Um, it's what today we might anachronistically call a failed state. And there's two key reasons for this. The first one is its proximity to the United States of America. As a later Mexican president famously said, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States of America. Uh, and nothing, um, that would that quote be no, no more opposite than in 1846 when the United States of America starts an illegal war, invades Mexico, uh, and it sends a small expeditionary force that marches its way inland occupying Mexico City and the stars and stripes unfurled across the magnificent central plaza uh, with the Catholic Cathedral looming on one side. Now those US troops only leave at an extortionately high price. Mexico is forced to sign away nearly half of its national territory. This is places like California today, it used to be part of Mexico. That's the price to get US troops out. And it's a national trauma and humiliation, it's a disastrous defeat to the United States. Uh, which Mexico doesn't really recover from. And unfortunately, the second reason is in the 1850s, rather than Mexican politicians rallying behind to try and unify the nation uh, and build it up again, there's a civil war that breaks out between liberals and conservatives. The liberals led by Benito Juarez, um, and they are arguing for secularization, modernization, breaking the power of the Catholic Church. Another faction, the Conservative Party, arguing for the opposite. They believe the only thing binding Mexico together is the Catholic Church. Now, Benito Juarez wins uh, in 1861. He enters the capital in triumph, holds elections, and becomes the constitutional president. But conservatives never accept the result. Uh, in fact, they flee to Paris, where they plot the overthrow of Benito Juarez. And what they want to do is establish a monarchy, because what I didn't tell you about Mexico is it actually becomes independent, unlike most other Latin American countries, as a monarchy. And to make Mexico great again, to coin a phrase, they think they need to return to that original independence plan. Now, of course, they're not powerful enough to do it themselves. Otherwise, they would have done. They've been defeated in civil war. But in Paris, they have the ear of one of the most powerful men in the world at the time. Um, and here he is, Napoleon III. Uh, magnificent moustache, I always think, but don't let that beguile you. He is a devious man who's launched his own attack on democracy in France in 1851. So he was, in fact, the first ever elected president of France, but the constitution of the republic he was president of prevented him from standing for a second election. And um, if anyone of you know your Bonapartist history, um, he's the nephew, by the way, of the more famous one. Um, then the obvious solution to these kind of constitutional problems is a coup d'etat. Uh, he overthrows the Second Republic, which is the regime he himself is president of and founds an, an empire in France. So having overturned uh, the republic and turned it into a monarchy, uh, in his own country, doing so in another doesn't seem quite so outlandish. And what the Mexican conservatives offer him is empire on the cheap, so that they will give France all of the benefits of colonialism uh, in the 19th century, but at a fraction of the cost, because the French army is going to play a relatively small role, or so Napoleon III hopes. Now, for any monarchy, you need a monarch, and that's where we have uh, Maximilian, and indeed his wife, Princess Charlotte, who should be on your screens now. So Maximilian, he's the younger brother of Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria. He, Maximilian is convinced of his destiny to rule, but like classic Trojan history, he's the second son. Uh, and Franz Joseph doesn't really like his brother. Uh, Maximilian is outgoing, he's gregarious, he's liberal, he's popular. Franz Joseph, very rigid, conservative, autocratic. So he keeps Maximilian at a distance. Now, another person who's convinced of Maximilian's destiny to rule is his wife. Um, Princess Charlotte, better known to Mexican history as Carlotta, precociously talented and determined to succeed. She's always encouraging Maximilian onto greater things. Uh, and in fact, Maximilian builds his fairy tale castle overlooking the Adriatic, beautiful, if you have visited today, Miramar. 
Um, but Carlotta, once she's installed there, she, she writes that what, she sees her life just staring out to sea uh, until old age. So when the offer of a crown in Mexico comes in in 1861, that allure of power and glory across the Atlantic uh, is preferable to perpetual on Europe, at least it is. Now, there are several problems with this plan, not least that the throne is imaginary. So this is the regime change um, and European imperialism, egregious example of it. The French army invades Mexico, and despite the promises of exiles um, in Paris, the Mexican nation rallies behind the constitutional president, Antonio Juarez. And Napoleon III only sends 6,000 troops, which gives you an indication of how easy he thinks it's going to be. And as these troops march on their way up to Mexico City, they stop before the walls of the second city of Mexico, Puebla. And the French army deploys in front of the city, the commanding officer incredibly confident that they're going to be victorious. But wave after wave of French infantrymen cut down by the heroic resistance of Benito Juarez. This goes down in Mexican history as Cinco de Mayo. So next time you're celebrating that, um, it's not about Mexican independence, it's about defeating the French. Napoleon III undeterred, sends reinforcements, and, and eventually does take the capital. But it's not until 1864, so this is nearly three years after Maximilian Carlotta accept the invitation, that they arrive in their new kingdom. And as they make this transatlantic voyage, they sail into the port of Veracruz and they look at their kingdom for the first time. And the docks are deserted. Uh, there's no one there to greet them. You would expect pomp and ceremony and cheering crowds uh, to receive the new monarchs. And Napoleon III has told them they will be welcomed as heroes. Um, this isn't the case. Now, there is some support for them in Mexico. Uh, it's not they're not entirely bereft of um, sympathizers, but uh, it's certainly not what Napoleon III had told them. And when they get to Mexico City, there's a much bigger reception and it's well orchestrated. But there are three huge problems that Maximilian and Carlotta need to solve. The first is that Benito Juarez has not been defeated. He's merely retreated northwards. The second is the United States of America is hostile to a monarchy on its borders, as you might expect. And the third is finances. Napoleon III has launched what we might call a leverage buyout. He's put the entire cost of this intervention onto the Mexican treasury, and Maximilian must meet those payments, or Napoleon III could, can withdraw his troops. Now, to cut a long story short, um, Maximilian is not the man uh, best equipped for the job. It would take a leader of extraordinary ability to overcome those problems. Maximilian is not without some talent. He's a good linguist, he's intelligent, he's charismatic in person, but he also has traits that don't lend himself to this kind of crisis. He prevaricates, procrastinates, uh, and is a huge um, interest of his is in science and butterflies. He often gets distracted by butterflies, he goes butterfly hunting, uh, rather than engaging in key government business. So you can see it's not necessarily the leadership skills you want of the crisis, under enormous pressure from the United States of America and the continued resistance of Benito Juarez, Napoleon III does that moment, which is which probably stand, stood out to me when reading through the sources, the language that the French emperor uses. He announces to the French people that mission accomplished. French troops are what they came to. Maximilian's empire is secure. French troops will be withdrawing in a phased withdrawal. Now, of course, that's just public consumption. Um, and when Maximilian finds out that French troops are going to be withdrawing, he decides to abdicate. He thinks the game is up, he can't continue without French assistance. Carlotta is furious. She refuses to accept defeat. She tells him that it's cowardice, it will be dispersing his name with dishonorable. So she will go back to Paris and convince Napoleon III to change his mind, which she does, but she fails. Um, Napoleon III doesn't change his mind. Now she's got one more trick up her sleeve and that's to appeal to the Pope. So she travels to the Vatican. Um, the idea is to get the Pope to endorse Maximilian's regime and that will rally Catholic Mexico behind the empire. But instead of discussing church-state relations, she has an incredibly dramatic meeting uh, with Pope, Pope Pius IX. She breaks down in tears, uncontrollable sobs uh, in the corridors of the Vatican in front of the Pope, accusing Napoleon III of trying to poison her uh, and claiming that her entire entourage is in the pay of the French Emperor was out to murder her. Now, of course, this is, this is division and paranoia. She's had a complete breakdown, um, a breakdown from which she never recovers and never goes back to Mexico, in fact. So meanwhile, back in Mexico, and I'll wrap this up quickly, um, Maximilian, when he hears that his wife has had this breakdown and he hears that Napoleon III is definitely withdrawing, his entire world shattered. So they were very close and she had helped him in ruling his empire. So he decides to abdicate again. 
But again, he's talked out of it. Um, and this is one of the key moments where he goes butterfly hunting. He gets his ministers to deliberate on whether he should stay rather than listen to that. He goes butterfly hunting. In the end, they convince him to stay because they tell him it would be dishonorable for a Habsburg to leave his post. Now they have a plan. Um, and by the way, by this point, Maximilian's empire is shrinking because Benito Juarez uh, forces a resurgent. Um, there's no longer French support. And of course, those imperialistas, people fighting for Maximilian, um, are not really that much of, of, a, of a leadership um, uh, you know, tactic to, to whether he's going to stay or go. So in fact, the Juarez is sort of taunting the imperialistas and saying, well, you know, the emperor's abdicated, you're fighting for a lost cause, even though Maximilian eventually decides to stay. It's huge damage. Now, the plan is that Maximilian will lead an army uh, to a town not far from Mexican City. And here, they will converge on the Harista forces and win uh, as the symbolic battle that will revive the fortunes of the empire. And it sounds like a desperate plan, and it is. Maximilian is, is going to lead the army. He's never led an army before. He's never even served in an army. And very soon, in the small town, um, Carreto, uh, they're under siege for two months. Maximilian um, is heroic in his own mind. I think he saw it as glorious. But one of his most loyal officers after two months um, crosses over into enemy lines, betrays him and leads the Paris to forces um, into the walls. And this is the citadel. Um, it was formerly a convent a citadel in which Maximilian put his headquarters. And you can see the damage from artillery fire and fighting. Um, he's very quickly court-martialed and sentenced to death, which brings us back to the man in painting. Um, now, it's historically inaccurate. Um, he wasn't in the center, he wasn't wearing a sombrero. But I think um, it does have a wider truth in it, some of which Maximilian would have, would have enjoyed. Um, he's meeting his death with a calm stoicism and honor, and he was obsessed by honor. Um, but perhaps better for him is the fact that the man preparing the coup de grace just off, off to the right has the conspicuous features of Napoleon III. Uh, and so the implication from Manet is clear it was the foreign intervention and the regime change that is, that is responsible for having blood on its hands. Um, I'll leave it there because I think I'm running out of time. Wow, what, what an amazing story that was. And I think I forgot to say at the beginning that the title of your book is The Last Emperor of Mexico. What an extraordinary, um, strange slice of history. Um, thank you so much for enlightening me and enlightening all of us. Um, thank you, Ed. And it just remains really for me to say thank you to all of our speakers for an absolutely fantastic evening. Um, starting off with, of course, the wonderful David Spiegelhalter, with Ed, with David, with Justin, and with Natasha. And of course, Adam's amazing story about eugenics, is, uh, which was very sobering. Um, that was a really good fun thank you all very very much thank you all at home for listening and do come and join us again soon we've got an amazing session lined up with amy liptrot plus we've got some really great classes on teaching writing and 5 by 15 as always has got loads for you to look at online plus our previous episodes so on that note i'd just like to wish you all very good night a big thank you to our speakers and all of you listening at home and see you soon and take care bye bye